I'm going to speak about one of my favorite subjects, which is high blood pressure. Uh, and it's one of my favorite subjects for many reasons. I'm a primary care general internist. Uh, and it's by far and away the most common thing that uh, family physicians and general internists and other primary care clinicians do in primary care practice is uh, help patients uh, with their uh, blood pressure. In addition, when we look at worldwide health, uh, depending on which study you read, uh, there's some evidence that high blood pressure is the number one cause of uh, preventable deaths uh, worldwide. Uh, others would argue tobacco is on that list or maybe diet is on that list, uh, but certainly high blood pressure is on the very, very uh, top of that list, if not first, then in the top three. In addition, in the United States, we know that uh, the rates of heart disease and stroke have been declining, particularly heart disease. Uh, and we, when we determine why that is, we know that a lot of the progress has been uh, from the way we treat uh, heart attacks and strokes in the intensive care unit. Uh, but over half of it is from the way we pr uh, work with prevention of heart attacks and strokes uh, with the treatment of uh, common risk factors, as we call them. Uh, and the three most important, again, are tobacco, uh, high blood cholesterol, and high blood pressure. And again, you could debate amongst those three which has had the most impact, uh, but again, uh, treatment of high blood pressure, control of high blood pressure is on the short list. Now, having said all that, um, another thing we know is that if you look at population studies, having a lower blood pressure is healthier than having a high blood pressure. And in fact, that relationship starts at pretty low blood pressure levels. In other words, if your blood pressure is even over 110, 120, your risk statistically uh, of having a heart attack or stroke begins to increase. But it's a very small amount for any given patient. And despite that observational evidence, that epidemiologic evidence, we still have a tremendous amount of controversy about at what level to actually begin treating it, and uh, if we're gonna treat it, how to treat it. And so uh, that's my plan for tonight, is to address uh, some of those uh, uh, larger questions, uh, both big and small, related to uh, the management of high blood pressure. Uh, and I'll do that uh, by first telling you that I have no conflicts related to the material or any of the medications or devices I'm gonna speak about tonight. And this is my roadmap. Uh, this is what I hope to cover for you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna begin with something that's uh, very basic, which is how do, how do I know if I have high blood pressure? Uh, and the corollary to that is what is the best way to measure it? So we'll spend uh, more time than you expect on that subject, because it turns out it's really, really important. How can I lower my blood pressure without medications? When do I need medications? At what threshold do we begin treatment? Is it 160, 150, 140, 130, 120? What's the right number? And then if you do need um, uh, treatment for high blood pressure, what medications are best? And uh, we'll touch on all of those uh, issues and several others uh, along the way. Now the other reason why I chose this subject for this year is because <clears throat> There's a tremendous amount of controversy about this subject in the medical community. And I'll spend some time discussing that with you. But as you know, uh, clinicians now make a lot of decisions in office practice, <clears throat> excuse me, based on clinical guidelines. Uh, and so many different groups of experts uh, write uh, guidelines based on their reading of the best evidence, uh, publish the guidelines. Uh, and we seek consensus, uh, and in many things that we do uh, over the years, uh, uh, we've developed certain consensus around, say, screening for colon cancer or mammography between the ages of 50 and 69, uh, or not doing pap tests under age 21. These are things where we as a community of experts have come together, and, most of the, and almost all the guidelines are uh, consistent and aligned with each other. But as you'll see, in the treatment of high blood pressure, we have guidelines that are uniquely distinct from each other and have major impacts. So depending on how you read the evidence, 
and or how, which guideline you choose to follow, uh, it really leads to big differences in whether you need medications, and if so, how many. Uh, and so I'll try to touch on uh, all of those things. So let's talk with measuring blood pressure. And uh, this is a humbling topic to talk about because uh, you can get your blood pressure measured now in the supermarket and the pharmacy and hair salons and, uh, and buy equipment uh, from Amazon or uh, your local medical supply store. Uh, the MAs or the medical assistants or the nurses all check it when you come in to see the doctor or the dentist. Um, uh, and uh, so it's, you, there's a lot of number, and you can of course check it at home. And so there's a tremendous amount of measurement of blood pressure being done. And the take home message here is that we are very poor at accurately measuring blood pressure. Uh, and I recently wrote a paper on this, and if, if you want to read more of the references there, uh, asking the question, uh, which is, how can we treat blood pressure correctly if we're not measuring it correctly? Uh, and I would argue we don't measure it correctly in any of the settings in which we have the opportunity to measure it. So let me review that a little bit. It's also humbling to talk about this because for any of you who are health professionals yourselves or have family members or are who are health professionals, this is the, the, almost the first thing everyone learns. Uh, and yet, despite that, uh, we do it uh, quite uh, imperfectly as a profession. Now, this is confusing because there are three different ways, uh, there'll actually be a fourth that I'll mention as well, uh, to measure blood pressure. Uh, and that is, and it has to do with the setting in which we measure it. So the most common is you go into someone's office, a doctor, a nurse practitioner, uh, whomever, and they measure your blood pressure. So that's called office measurement, and that's, that's actually been our gold standard. So when we look at studies of treatment of high blood pressure, uh, almost all of them have used office measurement as the gold standard. But of course, you can also measure blood pressure at home. Uh, and if you do that, <clears throat> if you include home measurement as part of someone's regimen, it turns out uh, that the patients end up using less medication. Uh, but they also have less good blood pressure control. And so it's a little bit of a trade-off because you tend to get lower numbers on average uh, when you measure at home. And I'll say more about that. And then the third option is something we call an ambulatory monitor. And these have been around for decades, uh, but they're very underutilized. Uh, and what they are is you would wear a blood pressure cuff. Uh, you could wear it for 24 hours or 18 hours while, while you're awake. It can be programmed to automatically take your blood pressure no matter what activity you're doing. And it gives us an average blood pressure uh, done uh, robotically, if you will, uh, over the course of 18 hours or 24 hours. And it turns out for some, from some recent evidence, these ambulatory monitors, this 24-hour average, uh, correlates the best with strokes and heart attacks. And when I use that abbreviation CVD, I'm talking about cardiovascular disease, which includes heart attacks uh, and strokes. Now, we have these three different categories of blood pressure, uh, and it turns out they measure different things, and they don't correlate all that well with each other. Uh, sometimes in medicine, if we're comparing diagnostic tests with each other, uh, we compare them to a gold standard and we can describe the characteristics of the test, which patients they might miss, which patients they might overdetect. The problem here is that we don't know which is the gold standard. So we can compare them to each other, but we don't really know what is the objective truth. Uh, so what we end up with is three different uh, strategies for measuring uh, blood pressure that we have to interpret uh, each one on its own. Now, <clears throat> the medical community has reached consensus on how to measure correctly. And the last time I counted from the, uh, of one of the official guidelines uh, that I'll uh, make reference to later, there were 19 different elements that constituted an accurate blood pressure measurement. Now, I've summarized these into eight, uh, but it includes all 19. I've just combined a few. Uh, but I, what I want you to do as I go through these is think about 
the last time you had your blood pressure measured in the office, and which of these were followed and which of these were not. And that's really the punchline. Uh, and we'll also get to the second punchline, which is when you're measuring your own blood pressure at home, you should do the same things that I'm about to describe that the clinician should do in the office. And so again, think about how you're measuring your blood pressure at home and which of these best practices uh, you're following. So one of the most important things is that you need to be seated for five minutes before the blood pressure is taken. So in my office, what happens off, uh, often, the patients uh, are, have trouble, they're late for the appointment, they're having trouble finding parking, there's traffic around the office. Uh, they finally get in, the, the, the parking spots are painted too tight. Uh, finally get it in, you almost hit the posts. Um, you rush upstairs, uh, the elevator's stopping at every floor. Uh, you finally come in, there's still time to get checked in by the nurse. Uh, and she sits you down and she starts reviewing your chief complaint and starts reviewing your medications. Uh, and while she does that, she's cranking up the blood pressure. Uh, so there are about six things wrong with that particular scenario. And one of the most important uh, is to allow the body to equilibrate before the blood pressure is measured. While the measurement is done, the back should be supported and the feet on the ground. Now, even in my own office where I see patients private, personally, I cannot do this because I have an exam table and the way the exam table is positioned to the cuff on the wall, I don't, it's not an exam table that goes up and down, so my patients don't have their back supported and don't have their feet on the ground, even in my own office. So you're not supposed to take any caffeine, exercise, or smoking for 30 minutes. I'll say more about caffeine later. Um, caffeine is not associated with um, high blood pressure chronically, but in the uh, short term, if you drink a cup of coffee right now, uh, it can increase the blood pressure. Uh, my personal favorite is no talking. So no talking by the patient and no talking by the person who's taking the blood pressure. Uh, so this is one certainly that the, um, these initial blood pressures are often done incorrectly. There should be no clothing under the cuff. Uh, another common mistake. So often your blood pressure is being taken in a public setting. The cuff is put on over your clothes. Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, the, blood, uh, the arm should be supported at the level of your heart, uh, the atrium, one of the chambers of the heart. Uh, so usually on a table or on the clinician's arm, but up a, in this uh, uh, relaxed position. And probably the most important of all, or one of the most important of this list, is a correct cuff size. Um, and so most of the blood pressure cuffs you purchase, if you don't go out of your way uh, to ask for a, a larger cuff, will be too small. And that's true for, because of obesity and overweight. That's true because of excess skin folds. That may be true because of excess muscle mass. Uh, but in our society, in my practice, I hang up the large cuff, I take out the other ones, I set them aside, and I never use them all day long. Because the large cuff will fit almost everyone. And if the large cuff is too, small, too large, uh, the, you do not get a falsely low value. The only thing that all of these different factors do is give you a value that's too high. So basically what we're doing is over-diagnosing high blood pressure by the incorrect measurement of blood pressure. And that's true in the office, and that's true at home. So um, again, that's a long list. It's a lot of time spent on this simple subject, but I think it's on the very short list, one of the most important things we can do to improve the way we manage high blood pressure. And as I implied, this is also true at home. So remember all of these things when you're checking blood pressure at home, these are the best practices that you should follow uh, at home. Can you comment about how tight you make the cuff? Uh, let me ask, I'll ask to take the questions at the end for the, um, so we, uh, for the editing purposes, but the question was how tight to make the cuff. Uh, the cuff is automatically, um, it's marked where to, uh, to fit it around the arm. Uh, uh, uninflated, it should be comfortable. Uh, and when you inflate it, it gets tight. And the tightness is derived by how many millimeters of mercury you inflate it to. Uh, so if your blood pressure, if I think your blood pressure might be 180, 
then I need to go higher than 180 in order to come down to get that measurement correct. Uh, and if I get up to 200, it's gonna hurt. Uh, if I think your blood pressure is 130, I might go up to 160, and that would feel uh, on the comfortable side of tight. Uh, so uh, the cuff itself, uh, just comfortably around the, so it stays on the arm by itself, basically. Uh, and, uh, and then the uh, pressure is what determines that feeling that, ooh, that hurts a little or that's too tight. The other controversy is um, what blood pressure to count. What do you write in the chart? Or what do you write on your log at home? Um, the, most of the guidelines in the United States talk about doing repeated measurements and averaging them. That's okay. Uh, it's a little hard to do the arithmetic in your head. You know, you have to be, you know, slick with the, uh, write, it, write down the value because you'll forget. To write down the second value, then average the two. That you, one can do that. In the office, it gets a little more complicated because the medical assistant or nurse has taken a, a blood pressure or two. Then do I count his or hers and, and then my own and average those two? Or do I do it twice myself and just average my two? Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about the best practice. But it turns out, and I'll show you this in a, different set, uh, in a, a few slides, it turns out that the acceptable way, and this is true, the Canadians do it this way, and in fact, most of the quality measures in the United States do it this way, is you can record the lowest value. So if you've taken it two or three times, you don't have to average, but you record the lowest one. And our definition of blood pressure control is determined using the lowest value. So many people make an error on that as well. Now, all of these things can lead to a dramatic increase in blood pressure, and I'm talking dramatic. 30 points millimeters of mercury. Uh, you know, on average, it's, you know, people report about 20, uh, but some people, it's, uh, it can be sub substantially higher. Um, so um, if your blood pressure is high, uh, it need, one of the first things to do is repeat it. And in fact, a study was just done um, that was published earlier this year, and it was a study from 20 different clinics um, in a city like ours. Uh, and uh, the uh, medical assistants were instructed on these 19 features that I just reviewed of taking the blood pressure best practice. Uh, and then they were instructed with one other thing, which was they were told if the blood pressure is elevated over, in this case, 140 over 90, take it again. And just by taking it a second time, the blood pressure was under 140 over 90 over a third of the time. So repeating the measurements r routinely give you a lower me measurement, in part maybe because that resting is happening now a little bit, that settling down that we talked about, and so on. Um, so that's a very easy trick, is just take it again, uh, and you can record the lower of the values. And as I talked, uh, I talked about, uh, this is an ongoing controversy, and different practices do this differently, but I think when you look at quality measures in the United States, including the ones we use from the federal government that are called HEDIS measures, um, or what uh, the Kaisers do in their population studies and so forth, um, the quality community accepts the lowest measurement when two or three values have been taken. Uh, but, but the guidelines still often talk about averaging multiple measurements. Now, there's also something that's not common. Uh, I call it research-grade measurement. Um, and this would be, th the way this was done in, the, in this one particular study, which I'll come back to, called the SPRINT study, uh, the Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial, uh, they had the medical assistant take the blood pressure akin to the way we would in the office. And then they would uh, in instruct the patient to go into a, a, a quiet room uh, that was with dim lighting. Uh, they would have an automatic machine, a robotic machine, to take the blood pressure. They would sit for five minutes. Uh, they had three automated measurements with some pause in between. There was no human in the room. Uh, all the different 19 features were being adhered to, uh, and the blood pressures were averaged. And what was fascinating about this is that when they compared the values they got in the dark room with the automated measurement, uh, 
it was 12 and a half points lower than what the nurse got in their advanced high blood pressure setting. And, right, this is a place where people were coming to see experts to participate in a big study. And even in that big study compared to the robotic dark room, uh, the dark room was 12 and a half points lower. Keep that in the back of your mind because you'll see this study turns out to be one of the major studies that has influenced uh, some of the guidelines that suggest we should treat people at much lower values. And so it's a little bit of a catch-22. Uh, if you're going to use the research grade measurement, which is 12 points lower, then treating at a lower threshold may be okay. But if you're going to measure it the way we normally measure it, then maybe treating it at the higher threshold is also okay. And you'll see where the guidelines uh, fall out in that regard. But remember this robotic measurement. And this, what we may see in the future uh, is that more people will move to this. It would be pretty easy to do in a busy office setting. You just set up, you need an extra room and, uh, and, uh, uh, and a robot, uh, just an automated machine basically, and uh, it's pretty easy to do. Um, but it's not how it's currently done. <clears throat> now, the other issue that has been become part of common practice led by consumers uh, and also uh, device makers is to measure the blood pressure outside the office. And uh, there is a consensus about doing this. In fact, the US Preventive Services Task Force as early as 2015, so several years ago, as part of their official recommendations for blood pressure management, suggested that measurements should be obtained outside the clinical setting, meaning outside of the uh, uh, physician's or nurse practitioner's, nurse practitioner's office before starting treatment. This is not common practice. Most clinicians continue to treat based upon their own measurement. Uh, but it is interesting because many of us follow the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines for other things like cancer screening. Uh, but in this case, it hasn't really uh, been fully integrated into uh, common practice. Uh, people use home management, uh, home measurement for a variety of things, but it's, it's not that common to use it routinely uh, uh, as a second test, if you will, before you begin treatment. However, in England, that's what they do. And so the blood pressure has to be checked outside of the office before the patient gets treated, especially with medications. All right, let me move next uh, to home measurement briefly. Um, I've already said several things about this. It turns out this is not well standardized. Uh, you all, if you're measuring your blood pressure at home, you're all doing it in your private time and space. And you know, I have no idea how you're doing it. Uh, I barely know how my medical assistant is doing it, but I certainly don't know how you d you're doing it. Uh, although one good trick is to bring your machine in with you when you see your clinician. Uh, and demonstrate to them how you are taking it, which gives you the opportunity to also make sure the cuff size is correct, that your technique is correct, uh, the, the machine is uh, a, a well-standardized machine, correlates with the office measurement, and so on. So that's not a bad little trick uh, if you want to be a little bit more precise in your home measurement. It's also not fully evidence-based, and what I mean by that is when patients are assigned blood pressure treatment with home measurement and compared to blood pressure treatment without home measurement, and that's the only extra intervention. There's no benefit of home measurement. Now that's a little misleading because if you then, if you did a, a real comprehensive program of blood pressure control that included pharmacy uh, involvement and home checks and frequent checks and combination pills and things like that, and home measurement, then as part of an integrated comprehensive plan, home measurement can be a useful tool. But when it's been isolated as the only extra thing that's done, it doesn't help that much. It's a little bit like checking blood sugars in people who are on pills for di diabetes. Uh, where, now I'm not talking if you're taking insulin, then you must check your home blood sugar, but if you're just taking pills, uh, for, depending on the pills, uh, many patients do not need to check their home blood sugar, and it's not associated with a very significant change in uh, diabetes control. And this is analogous uh, to that. 
Correct home monitoring requires all 19 uh, of those other elements. Uh, so everything that I suggested uh, in the office, you should do uh, at home. And therefore, uh, again, bringing the, your equipment in and having the, uh, the nurse or physician uh, watch you take your blood pressure is a good way to make sure that your own skills uh, are up to best practices. And again, things like uh, correct uh, equipment uh, uh, and is also uh, extremely important. And, and that's complicated now because there's so much new equipment. Uh, many, many of the new devices have not been well validated. And so people are selling all sorts of things on fingertips and wrists and, and so forth. And many of those measurements have not been validated in rigorous studies. And when they have been studied in rigorous studies, do not correlate particularly well with the measures that I've, I'm discussing. The correct timing is interesting because, as I mentioned, with the ambulatory monitor, it's around the clock. And so you could argue that uh, doing home measurement that mimics the ambulatory monitor might make sense, and um, that, that's not a bad way to do it. So rather than checking it every day or every day twice a day or whatever, you could argue maybe I'll check it five times a day, one day per month. Uh, akin to my using an ambulatory monitor, so getting, getting a measurement throughout the day because the blood pressure goes up and down in a diurnal rhythm over the course of a 24-hour period. Uh, it's highest in the morning and it's lowest in the evening. So if you're checking your blood pressure uh, uh, after dinner, especially after a glass of wine, kids are asleep, uh, everything's copacetic, uh, that's, you're going to get a lower blood pressure then uh, than if you check it uh, when you first wake up in the morning before you've taken your medications. Uh, so that's important to know. And so what our current guidelines are, um, you can do this all day, one day, every now and again model, but the standard uh, recommendations are to check it uh, in the morning before you take your medications and then before dinner uh, as uh, a way to frame um, uh, the higher and lower uh, but I don't recommend, uh, there are very, very few patients who need to do this every day. Uh, you, you, you get too much information, you get too worried about it, it's not adding value, uh, but it is something to do uh, uh, occasionally and keep track of it uh, and again, share that information with your clinician. Home measurements, as I mentioned, are lower than office measurements and sometimes people talk about having different normals. Um, but the relationship is not uniformly predictable. So I can't say if your blood pressure is 145 in the office, it's 135 at home. It could be, but it might not be. So it's not a fixed relationship. Uh, on average, it's lower, but in any individual patient or any individual measurement, the correlation uh, is a little bit better than a coin flip, but not a ton better. It's about 60 or 70% correlation. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, when you isolate home management as the only intervention, um, the, the evidence has shown little impact. All right, the final uh, part of this section is to talk about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Um, and again, this is a, a machine you would normally pick it up from uh, the cardiology suite or where you might get an electrocardiogram or maybe an echocardiogram or certainly a Holta monitor. Uh, uh, that's where these live. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, Medicare will cover these, uh, especially if um, the right diagnosis is put down, uh, the right diagnosis being elevated blood pressure, because uh, you're using it to help decide whether someone has hypertension, which is the disease, versus not hypertension. Uh, so Medicare will pay if you use elevated blood pressure. And again, I already described how it works. You can program it to do anything you want. Typically, it's several times an hour while you're awake, uh, and usually a few times at night. Most people can sleep through this. Again, it's lower than the office, but the relationship is unsettled. But as I mentioned, the uh, recent studies, including a very thorough review by the US Preventive Services Task Force, has suggested that it, it predicts amongst a population of people uh, who's going to get into trouble with cardiovascular disease uh, than the other tools. That is to say, it, it makes blood pressure measurement the most predictive risk factor for heart disease and stroke compared to office measurement or home measurement. So when we, it's available, uh, it's safe, uh, it's not that expensive. Um, 
but we use it quite infrequently uh, in modern American medicine. And, it, and, and I think one of the things I favor is using it a bit more uh, because uh, misdiagnosing someone with high blood pressure usually means a lifetime of medications because it's rare once people get diagnosed with high blood pressure that they get undiagnosed with high blood pressure. That requires a little bit of courage on, on uh, the patient's part and the clinician's part. Uh, it also is the best way to detect something that's been called white coat hypertension. Uh, and this is that syndrome where your blood pressure is high in the office and low everywhere else. Uh, that does exist. Uh, it's more common in women than men. It's more common in young than old. It's more common in ca Caucasians than African Americans. So it does exist. It's most common in uh, young Caucasian women. Uh, and uh, when you see an elevated blood pressure in the office as a young woman, uh, which is very important to diagnose correctly because of the impact it can have on pregnancy, uh, but it can also be overdiagnosed, and that's a setting where careful home measurements or an ambulatory monitor can be particularly uh, important. You can also use it to monitor treatment uh, and for some other purposes. So, in summary, this simple task that we do uh, from, uh, uh, from you know, the pharmacy to the hair salon to your home to my office uh, to the cardiologist's office uh, is turns out to be a little bit more complicated than we thought. Um, uh, and from a clinician point of view, it's, uh, we talk about really rethinking the office workflow. Um, I think who's ever taking the blood pressure, it's good to repeat the measurement. Uh, we, the, uh, whoever you're working with should think about whether to take averages or record the lowest value. Uh, home measurements are good. Uh, we probably do it more than we need to, but less accurately than we need to. So if you're going to do it, do it well, uh, but maybe a little less often. And make sure uh, you're following best practices, particularly things like cuff size, rest, and so forth. Uh, and again, similarly, the ambulatory monitor uh, should be used more. Probably doesn't need to be used in every patient uh, or uh, even every patient with nuanced at high blood pressure, but we certainly... Uh, whenever we have a sort of a tiebreaker uh, and a patient doesn't want to be on meds, uh, for example, and the, the clinician's thinking, eh, I mean, you should be on meds, perfect situation to uh, get another data point uh, and get the average under the curve and the area under the curve and uh, use the ambulatory monitor. All right, so I'm going to move on. Uh, that's what I have to say about measurement. Uh, I think that's... Um, the longest section of the talk, uh, and, um, but I think probably the most impactful of the way it would, uh, if done correctly, change uh, how we as clinicians practice uh, and how you uh, manage your own blood pressure at home. <clears throat> I want to sp uh, speak briefly about uh, treating high blood pressure without medications. Uh, this is something I've been interested in since uh, early in my career. As many of you know, I studied nutrition before I came to medical school, and I've looked for the uh, interface between nutrition and internal medicine and chronic illness for my entire career. Uh, and one of the first studies I ever participated in was a study that compared uh, what we called non-pharmacologic or non-drug therapy for high blood pressure with drugs. Um, that study, it was a great study. We had 300 uh, patients uh, that we recruited, and we managed them very carefully. My job was to teach them how to manage it without drugs. Uh, and at the end of uh, two, a year of follow-up, the drugs won hands down. Uh, and in fact, uh, the NIH had funded that study, and they had funded about a dozen others at the same time. And every single study showed the same thing. The drugs outperformed non-drug treatment uniformly across the board. So medications are very effective for lowering blood pressure. We'll say more about that in a minute. And non-pharmacological therapy is a relatively modest tool in your toolbox across all patients. But for an individual patient, it can be the answer. Uh, and so in the study, we were looking at the average blood pressure between 300 patients or 150 on the non-drug and 150 on the drug. But for an individual patient, the things I'm about to talk about can be extremely effective and can either slow the need to take medications uh, or uh, allow you to take one less medication uh, or, in some cases, completely treat the blood pressure without medication. 
So it's a very potent tool in the toolbox for a, for a motivated patient, especially one who has certain clinical characteristics. Now, one of the most important or predictive characteristics is if you're overweight or obese. Uh, and so if, if your weight is high and you have high blood pressure, and there's a close correlation of those two things, then weight loss is uniformly effective at lowering high blood pressure. So if a patient can lose 20 pounds uh, and keep it off for a year or so, the blood pressure will go down a ton and it's worth at least one or two different uh, pills or classes of medications. So the problem is that it's really hard to lose 20 pounds and keep it off. Uh, but for the patient who's at that point where it's re you're ready to do that, uh, then weight loss always works at lowering blood pressure. Uh, and it's quite well sustained. Now, eventually, as you gain weight, or even if you kept the weight off as you age, you're at risk of the blood pressure drifting upward again over time. Uh, but you can delay uh, medication for quite some time uh, if you're effective uh, at treating high blood pressure with weight loss in those that are overweight. Alcohol can also raise blood pressure. Um, you don't have to become a teetotaler if this is the case. Uh, but if your blood pressure is high and you're a moderate to heavy alcohol user, uh, three, four, five drinks a day kind of class is the way some of these studies were done, and can get down to one drink a day, the blood pressure can come down uh, quite uh, nicely, although the amount you'll see is smaller than with weight loss. But it's, uh, it's a real effect. Uh, but there aren't that many patients who drink that much and are willing to stop drinking just for a little bit of blood pressure control. They'd rather take a medication, I think, uh, in many cases. Salt intake is something I'll say more about, um, but we've recommended salt restriction or sodium restriction for decades for high blood pressure. It's part of our public health recommendations for a healthy diet. Um, and the numbers are complicated, and I won't review them particularly, but in general, um, <clears throat> uh, restricting sodium can lower blood pressure very effectively, but only in some patients. And it's probably somewhere about a third to a half um, and so it's a very effective tool for treatment of high blood pressure in some patients, uh, but is more controversial about whether the whole society needs to lower our salt intake. In other words, because a lot of patients with high blood pressure won't benefit uh, from so sodium restriction. But if you have high blood pressure, and if you're on a high sodium intake, and uh, if you're African American in particular, uh, or older in particular, both of which are associated with reduced clearance of sodium by the kidney, so uh, reduced handling of a salt load, if you will, uh, then sodium restriction can be quite uh, important. Some of the recommendations in the past have recommended extreme sodium restriction. That doesn't work and may be dangerous. Um, and again, moderate sodium intake for most people uh, is fine. Uh, but it's a tool in your toolbox um, uh, if uh, you want to give it a try, especially if you're not overweight and if you don't drink that much, uh, then it's third on the list and it's worth a try. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. There's something called the DASH diet, which has been around for about 15, 20 years, uh, which is basically just a heart-healthy diet. So all the, the principles of um, eating a healthy diet uh, with uh, mostly plants, uh, not too much, uh, real food, uh, and uh, uh, with, relying on mostly fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, small amounts of meat, fish, and fowl, uh, 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 nuts and oils, and so on, a Mediterranean-type diet or a heart-healthy diet. Uh, that's been shown to lower blood pressure. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's uh, uh, additive with sodium restriction. So if you combine a heart-healthy diet and sodium restriction, the blood pressure goes down further. Physical activity can lower the blood pressure. We recommend physical activity for everyone uh, anyway. As I like to say, physical activity is biblical. Uh, that means you should do it six days a week and one day of rest. Uh, the recommendations are 30 plus minutes a day. Uh, and that, uh, if you start sedentary and you get to that point, can lower the blood pressure by uh, five to 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, 
And as I implied earlier, uh, habitual caffeine consumption or coffee consumption uh, is not associated with the risk of high blood pressure. In fact, coffee consumption seems to be the Teflon substance. Uh, that is, it's not been shown to be bad for almost anything. Uh, but certainly, the studies that have looked at mortality, heart disease risk, cancer risk, stroke risk, risk and the like, uh, have shown uh, caffeine to be not associated with uh, bad outcomes uh, in general. Now, clearly, it can make you uh, irritable, it can give you GI problems, uh, it can cause atrial fibrillation in some people. But in general, when you look at populations, uh, caffeine as a fatigue mitigator, as we call it with the residents, uh, is, uh, is safe and effective. Once upon a time, when I was a nutrition graduate student, I used to say, and I had a slide that said this, it was a while ago, uh, that a third of the salt in the human diet comes naturally occurring in food. A third comes from food processing, and a third comes from uh, us as consumers at the stove or at the table. And that now is just totally wrong. Uh, it, we've evolved over those 40 years to the point where our diets are different and our sodium sources have changed to the point now where processed and restaurant foods account for almost 80% of our salt intake. So. Still a small amount uh, from naturally occurring in foods and uh, still some at home. But if someone tells you or someone suggests to you or if your own reading suggests that you want to be in a lower sodium intake, worrying too much about what you do at the stove or the table is most likely the wrong tactic. Uh, and what you need to do is not purchase anything in a bag or a box or a can. Uh, unless it says in really big letters, low salt, because anything in a bag or a box or a can is high salt, unless it says otherwise. Uh, and so the whole story of when you go to a, a big market, only shopping in the outer aisle of the market where the produce is and the dairy and so forth uh, makes very good sense. So don't <laughs> limit your uh, consumption of things in general that are in a bag or a box or a can if you're concerned about your salt or for that matter, uh, current dietary recommendations. Secondly is restaurant food and other packaged and prepared foods. So, um, so a lot of the services that are out there delivering food, uh, but particularly restaurant food. I don't know if any of you have gotten into the, into the game of weighing yourself every day and the, the night after you went to your favorite whatever restaurant that's particularly high in soy sauce or uh, uh, or uh, whatever, and you, your uh, blood, your weight goes up four pounds, and you say, "This is not possible." You know, I didn't eat anything yesterday, but I, then you realize you went and had sushi or your favorite uh, Thai food restaurant, uh, and it was all because of the sodium intake. So those changes in weight are all f salt and water. So a couple of days later, it'll come off. Um, but that's that, that's showing you uh, how much sodium is in that uh, food that you ate at the restaurant. And, and the worst culprit, of course, is fast food. So not to pick on Asian cuisine, uh, but fast food is by far and away um, the, most, the biggest culprit here. And of course, in our society, um, that's a concern. So sodium restriction, is if you're eating a mostly plant diet, um, and you, you know, you're eating your nice tomatoes and you want to put some salt on it, and that makes you eat more tomatoes, that's a good thing to do. Uh, or if it helps you consume your lettuce and your big salad, uh, do it, uh, because that's healthy. Uh, but going to a fast food restaurant or buying food that's in a bag or a box or a can is not. All right. I'm going to move next to um, the, some of the clinical questions that are most uh, on the mind of uh, clinicians. Um, working with patients with high blood pressure in terms of medication management, labeling, and so forth. Um, and most of what we know about high blood pressure over the course of uh, the last decades, uh, most of, all of my career, have been from a, an entity called the Joint National Commission. And this is a NIH uh, brought together panel of experts. They meet every five to seven years or so, and they come up with different recommendations. And over the years, they've defined what's a normal blood pressure. They've recommended certain types of drugs over other drugs and so on. <clears throat> and the most recent one was a few years ago. It was the eighth version of this. 
Um, and they asked three questions. Um, and this was good because they were three really good questions, the three questions that we all care about, which is, uh, does treatment of, a, of blood pressure at a certain level of elevation work? Um, if so, how low should I treat it? Good questions. And third, what medication should I use? Does it matter? And what they did was, which was different than the seven previous uh, Joint National Commissions, is they only looked at what we call randomized clinical trials, which is the highest level of medical scientific evidence uh, where there's a, a control group, uh, blinded um, evaluation of large uh, uh, populations of patients. And there had been several dozen of these uh, that met the criteria uh, for various questions related to high blood pressure. And they came out with nine recommendations. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, I'll summarize. Uh, the, the one that was most surprising, I wouldn't call it controversial at first, but it was, it was definitely a surprise, was the recommendation that for people over 60 years old, which is a lot of the population who has high blood pressure in the United States, that we could use 150 as our cut point rather than 140. So this was really great news for primary care and really great news for patients. Uh, because if it meant we could let people ride a little higher, then that means one less medication typically, less side effects, less costs, and so on. So this was a, a very good recommendation, very popular recommendation amongst the primary care community. Uh, but others didn't react so favorably, as I'll show you. And they recommended lowering it below 150 and also lowering the, a second number, the lower number, the diastolic blood pressure, to less than 90. So this was a surprise, but favorable. And it wasn't uh, pulled out of the sky, and I'm not going to review this, but each of these abbreviations stands for, stands for a really big, well-done, publicly funded, randomized clinical trial of the treatment of high blood pressure. And so they looked at a very large body of evidence in order to make this conclusion. So it was very, what we would call, evidence-based. As uh, the other recommendations uh, were uh, not as controversial, uh, they said for everyone else under 60, uh, then you should use 140 as your cut point, uh, or uh, if you, b treating both the high number or the low number, using 90 as uh, the low number. Uh, I should just point out that the, it turns out that the high number is more important than the low number. Um, when I was in medical school, that wasn't the case. We mostly focused on the lower number, uh, what we call diastolic hypertension. But it turns out uh, that systolic hypertension is the most predictive of uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, and stroke. At the time this was being, these studies were being uh, analyzed, the diabetes community was trying to suggest that lower values would be better, uh, but they reviewed the evidence carefully and said, you know, even in diabetics, it doesn't really matter. People with kidney disease, CKD stands for chronic kidney disorder, chronic kidney disease, didn't matter. You could use 140. And people were pushing that in the African-American community where there was a lot of risk associated with hypertension that lower numbers might be better. They looked at that literature and, and said it doesn't matter. And so basically, they concluded that 140 over 90 was fine for everyone, that there were many patients over 160 that you could let ride a little bit and drift up to 150, although they also said if the patient was under 140 and well-controlled, that was fine too. So you were given some flexibility for people over, one, uh, over age 60. The medications they recommended were four. Uh, and previous re recommendations have uh, favored one class over another. They were a little bit more agnostic, gave us a smorgasbord of uh, four medications, um, <clears throat> except it was really four ways to get to three, uh, because two of them shouldn't be used together. So the four categories are thiazides, which are water pills, uh, weak water pills, but which have an independent uh, uh, blood pressure lowering effect. CCB stands for calcium channel blockers. I'll give you the specific names of some of these in a minute. Uh, those work. Uh, ACE, ACE I stands for ACE inhibitor, uh, 
um, and uh, there are, I'll give you the names. Uh, and the fourth category are angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, um, and they also can be used as the first class of drugs. The, the, um, the, the, the one um, uh, corollary here was not to use ACE and ARB together. So you could use ACE or ARB, either first, second, or third, and then thiazide first, second, or third, or in calcium channel blockers, first, second, or third. So that was sort of the modern menu. Uh, and that was, again, good for patients, because there were a lot of medicines in these classes, good for physicians, because there are medicines uh, we knew how to use. They, you'll note, or you may note, that one class of medicine that's not on this list are beta blockers. Uh, uh, and beta blockers have been used for high blood pressure for many, many years. They're very good for other conditions. Um, but when studied compared to these four drugs, they're not as effective as a single therapy. Uh, but that's a little misleading because they're excellent as the third or fourth drug, or they're excellent if you need it for something else. So it still lowers your blood pressure, just not quite as evidence-based in terms of preventing strokes in particular as these other four classes of medicines. But it's still on the list. We use it all the time. It's a very effective way to lower blood pressure, but just not as the first or second drug as the main uh, blood pressure lowering treatment. In uh, something that not everyone knew, although it was, it's been in the literature for several decades, is that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers do not work as well in African Americans as the other classes of drugs. So they specifically went out of their way and said, for African Americans, we recommend thiazides or calcium channel blockers first. Again, that's also a little misleading uh, because many patients need, most patients need more than one medication. Uh, and again, once you've gotten to drug number three, uh, you begin to go back to ACE and R very quickly in African Americans. But you would start with thiazide diuretics or a calcium channel blocker as your drugs of first choice. And in kidney disease, that's the one disease with specific recommendations, especially if you're spilling uh, protein in the urine, uh, then ACE inhibitors and ARBs have a long history of helping preserve kidney function. But that's really more uh, in the context of having chronic kidney disease than just bland uh, essential hypertension. So those were the recommendations. Uh, and we read this and said, all right, that's sensible. They asked the right questions. They looked at the right body of evidence. Um, these are patient-centered, uh, good for primary care. Uh, everything was good. Um, and then the sky fell. Uh, but these are the medicines that, just to show you some of the names, these are not the brand names. These are the, the generic names or the chemical names. But you may still recognize them, because many of these medications have been around for decades. They're all generic. They're inexpensive. They're on everyone's formulary. Not necessarily all of them in each category, but one from each category is on everyone's formulary. And so it's pretty easy to find an ACE inhibitor that works. An allopril, a lisinopril are pretty common. Uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, losartan is probably the most common. Valsartan is the one that had a little bit of imperfections in the synthesis. So that's been uh, out of circulation of late. Um, but there are others in that class. Uh, the calcium channel blockers are uh, amlodipine is a common one um, for high blood pressure. Diltiazem and, uh, is another one. Um, and then the thiazide type diuretics in the United States, by far and away the most common is hydrochlorothiazide, uh, although some of the others also work. So again, uh, lots of choices. They're cheap. They're easily available. Doctors and nurses know how to use them because they've been around forever. Um, and so it's a good list. And then there is, I, I'm not going to show you, but there's, of course, uh, 15 other categories of medicines that uh, high blood pressure experts and others can use if you need more than uh, three, three classes of medicine, although most patients do not. So then what happened is soon after the guidelines came out, a big study was published. And I've already made reference to this, the SPRINT study. This was the one with the, ro with the robot in the dark room uh, measuring blood pressure. It was a really well done study. It was uh, almost 10,000 men and women. Uh, they were over age 50. Uh, they had a pre-designated uh, group that were over age 75, so that was well done. Uh, 
To get into the study, you needed a blood pressure over 130, which was fine. Uh, and you needed to have a high cardiovascular risk. Um, and I'll explain that more in a moment, uh, but it's an important uh, part of this conversation. Interestingly, they did not accept people with diabetes into the SPRINT study. Uh, and that was a little bit puzzling, unless you knew that in the year or two before the SPRINT study was being planned, there had been another big study uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health, so a very well done randomized trial, that compared 140 versus 120, the two blood pressures, in patients with diabetes to see which was better, and there was no difference. And so the conclusion was that 140 was as good as 120, and of course that made it much easier to treat patients because again it was one or two less medications. Each medicine lowers your blood pressure about 10 points or so on average. So, uh, so 20 points is a couple of meds. So that was sort of weird because we already knew that in diabetes it didn't make any difference, but they were doing the study again but had to exclude patients with diabetes. So it was a little bit um, uh, funny the way that uh, played out. But it does mean that the results of the study do not apply to patients with diabetes, who of course are one of the groups of patients for whom treatment of high blood pressure is most important because uh, they're at high risk of strokes, heart attacks, kidney disease, and so on. They compared people to get, they randomized people to 120 or 140, uh, similar to the diabetes study. Uh, it took an extra medicine to get people in, in the under 120. Uh, and it turned out it was hard to get people under 120. The average was actually 121, which means on average about half the patients weren't, couldn't get below 120, even though they were getting free medicine, uh, being seen by their clinician regularly, uh, uh, more frequent than you would see someone in normal uh, clinical practice and so on. So that was interesting also that people couldn't actually get less than 120, especially this cohort of uh, somewhat older uh, patients. And this is the diabetes study. I won't go over it in detail, uh, but it uh, again showed that there was no difference between 120 and 40, 140 before the SPRINT study. Now the SPRINT threw us a curveball because the results were positive. That is to say, um, they had uh, when they looked at all the events associated with high blood pressure, that is stroke, heart attack, non-fatal non stroke and heart attack, death from stroke and heart attack, it turned out that there were less events in the group that was treated to 120. So this was a positive study suggesting that 120 was better than 140. But this was a little counterintuitive because we already had six or seven studies that I showed you 10 slides ago that said it didn't really matter. We had this big diabetes study that said it didn't matter. But here was this new study that said it matters. Um, and, and then the, the hooker was that it also uh, uh, led to less mortality, that people died less often uh, at 120 than 140. So this created two different conversations. So there was a group of people who thought that Sprint was the end all, um, and that affected the way you look at this. Other people looked at this, you know, this is an unexpected result. We're not sure what it all means. Um, and uh, the conversation um, continued and got louder. There were a lot of side effects on the SPRINT study. Um, these were pre things they looked at carefully in advance. Uh, there was 67% more risk. And these were serious side effects. The, the criteria for this was side effects that the clinician thought was serious enough to send the patient to the emergency department or might be life-threatening. That was the way the criteria was defined. So these are real. Uh, low blood pressure, 67% more. Syncope, that is passing out, losing consciousness, a third more. Uh, uh, blood chemistry abnormalities, a third more. And kidney problems, two-thirds more. So there were a lot of side effects. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the overall effect was beneficial. And it's a little hard to explain uh, the concept here, but there's something in medicine we think about a lot, which is called the number needed to treat. Uh, and I'll show you this graphically in a couple of slides, but basically it's a way to put uh, an, uh, like a, the odds of you personally benefiting from an intervention. So remember, these studies are in populations of patients. 
But now you and I are sitting across the table deciding what to do for you. Um, and so what are the, what's the likelihood that you will benefit given what we know about these populations that benefit? You with me on this? It's a, it's a confusing subject, but it's a, way, it's a way to put some numbers on the concept of better versus worse uh, and quantitate it so that people can make individual decisions. And I'll, and I'll show you this graphically, it'll be clear in a minute. Uh, but in general, the number needed to treat uh, was about roughly 100, depending on what you measured, over three years. So that's about uh, 300 over the course of any one year. Uh, so it means that if you and I are sitting across the table from each other, the odds are 299 to 1 that you're not the one that's going to benefit. You with me on this? So the population benefits. But you may not. In fact, the odds are you won't. And that's just the way medical science works. Uh, similarly, the number needed to harm is about the same. So we get some benefit, we get some harm, and you'll have to decide for you which is better. Now, of course, in the way this study was done, the benefits are better than the harms, right? The benefit included heart attack, strokes, and death. And the harms, and you know, the harms are things like, you know, feeling lightheaded uh, and falling down and having an abnormal blood test. So they're not the same. Um, but it is worth noting that the frequency was similar. These are all uh, comments I've already made. And the last bullet, though, is that when you look at how the Sprint study applies to the community at large, to all of you. They're pro they're statistically, they're only about one out of six of you that would meet the criteria to have been a, a client, a, a subject in the SPRINT study. In other words, uh, whether it's age or other diseases uh, or what your cardiovascular risk was, whether you had diabetes, all those things were factors that determine whether you can enter the study or not. And only one out of six patients with high blood pressure were able to enter the study. So again, the generalizability to the community at large uh, is modest. Uh, and here are some of the risk factors. So there was no one with, who had diabetes, no one with stroke, no one who was frail, uh, and no one who was, I should say, under age 50. Uh, and as I mentioned, there was free care, frequent visits, uh, and so forth. And this very careful measurement that was lower than the usual measurement, if you remember. Then the other thing that was really important to know is that these were very high-risk patients. Um, and that we, many of you have probably um, gone to websites and measured your 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease, of having a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, there's a very good one on the uh, Mayo Clinic. Uh, it's called the Mayo Clinic Statin Decision um, Site. Uh, if you just Google Mayo Clinic uh, Statin, uh, it comes up. And you can put in your various risk factors and calculate your 10-year risk. And we use it in clinical practice a lot to decide who needs a statin drug for, the, for their risk. Um, but it's also relevant in this conversation about high blood pressure. Uh, and in fact, to enter this study, you needed a 10-year risk of about 15 percent. Uh, and in fact, most people had 20 percent. If you've had a heart attack, your risk of having an event in the next 10 years is 20%. So 20% is a high number in this conversation. Uh, it's like you've already had a heart attack. And so these are people who are on the fairly far along spectrum of risk of cardiovascular disease. And here's the cartoon. It doesn't, it doesn't project uh, super well. Uh, but what this is trying to say is bring to life that concept of number needed to treat. Uh, and what I mean by this is, the, so each gr little gray box represents one person. And if we have, say, on the left-hand side here, a 1,000 people, we can show who are then treated uh, for three years to a blood pressure goal of 120 rather than 140 based on the data from the SPRINT study. We know that 22, 16 of them will not have a heart attack or stroke in the three-year period. That's, that's an, it's the same as the number needed to treat. I've just done some arithmetic and, and made it a cartoon. Um, 
But the point of this, the way to think of this, again, if you think about odds, if you started as one of the gray people, the vast majority of the gray people stay gray after three and a half years of being on two and a half medicines, right? Only a very small number become blue. And that's that idea that what happens in populations is different than what happens in an individual patient. You with me? So this is very, it's a very intriguing way to think about medical interventions. And you can do this kind of chart with anything. And we do it with cholesterol, we do it with a lot of cardiovascular management, but you can do this with lots of other things. So if you have pneumonia from pneumococcal, uh, pneumo uh, pneumococcal disease, and I give you penicillin, almost every one of you, maybe 80% of you will get better, right? So the number of boxes, this would all be blue if this were talking about pneumonia and penicillin. But now we're talking about treatment of a risk factor to prevent events over a period of time, and the number of people who benefit one by one is much less. Um, and so this is a, an important uh, concept. And again, just to balance it, uh, almost an equal number were harmed, although to be fair, the Benefits are more important than the harms, but the harms are real. And again, take home point here, most people started gray and stay gray. Very few people change as a result of this intervention, even though everyone has to take the medications. All right, so let me uh, close this part of the conversation and we can uh, then take some questions. The long and the short of it is uh, this study came out and there has then started and has continued to this day a debate in the medical community about what to do. And so the cardiologists took this study and came out with some guidelines that said, I'll show you them in a minute, we should follow these guidelines. And then the, uh, just around the same time, the primary care community, the internal medicine community and the family medicine committee looked at the guidelines and said, you know, actually we like the Joint National Commission guidelines. We like 150 if you're over age 60. Uh, for everyone else, 140. But the cardiologists uh, said something totally different. They said um, that if it's over 130, you should be treated. Um, 140, everyone should be treated, and 130 if you're at high risk. And that anyone over 120, we would call an elevated blood pressure. So it totally changes the conversation from 140 to 120 based on the results of this one big study. Uh, and so these are what their uh, recommendations are for treatment, basically saying if you've already had a heart attack, then we should treat you using 130 as the cut point. Uh, if you're at very high risk of having a heart attack, we should treat you at 130. And if you're at lower risk, less than 10%, then 140 is okay. Uh, and so Though that's now the debate. We have the 130 and 140 school, and we have the 140 and 150 school. And we're all just caught in the middle. Uh, and we have two groups of really smart people looking at the same studies and drawing completely different conclusions. Now, to try to sort this out, there have been a couple of studies of late. There was one just published this week. I don't have a slide from, but it's, uh, uh, it's consistent, sort of, with what I'm going to show you. But this was a very nice study that was published this year that looked at all of the studies of high blood pressure. It was 70 different studies, uh, uh, 300,000 patients, uh, included men and women, uh, 60 years old. And basically, they tried to answer the question of, does it matter what the blood pressure is when you start, uh, when you start treatment? And basically, they looked at all the studies, and they said, and the, the star here, the asterisk, means that the results are significant. And what they showed is that if your blood pressure is over 160 and you treat it, treatment works. There's a 7% the 7 reduction in mortality and a 22% reduction in cardiovascular events. So everyone agrees with that. If it's over 160, it should be lowered. 140 to 160, this study showed it works. So if it's over 140, it works. I will note there was a, pa a paper published this week that just showed even between 140 and 160, it's not so clear that it works. 
If it's less than 140, it doesn't work. So even though blood pressure becomes a risk factor at low levels, if you're less than 140 when you treat it, you don't get any benefit from that treatment according to these 70 studies. So over 160 it works, over 140 it works, although now we have a little debate there, but under 140 it doesn't work. With the one possible exception in people who have heart disease, CHD stands for coronary heart disease. So if you already have had a heart attack, then uh, it's reasonable uh, to treat at 130, which is what the cardiology guidelines say. And then what happened after this conversation is that the uh, family physicians independently and the internists again looked at their data and all the recommendations. They said, well, what do we think? Are we going to go along with the cardiology guidelines? And they both said no. So we're going to stick to the guidelines we published a couple of years ago uh, and still stick with uh, 150 if you're over uh, age 60 or 140 for most patients. It's also worth noting that if you use 120, if you use the guidelines that uh, the cardiology guidelines suggest, that half the population is now labeled as having hypertension. And you know, that just doesn't have face validity, right? It doesn't make sense that, that all of us would be sick. That half the population would be uh, hypertensive. So my final thoughts, and then we'll open it up. Um, uh, we talked about measuring uh, blood pressure differently in the office uh, uh, with carefully following the 19 guidelines. Um, I would say if you're uh, a patient in an office like that, uh, you should uh, ask the clinician to retake your blood pressure if the first measurement is high. Uh, sometimes it's not feasible to do that out where the, the medical assistant took the blood pressure. But maybe when you get in to see your, uh, uh, your personal clinician, uh, that would be a time to have the blood pressure taken again in a close to correct method as possible. Uh, I think it's, it's excellent to do home monitoring, get a good, a good machine, something that fits over the arm. Don't play with the wrists, fingers, and so on. Uh, make sure it uh, covers your arm the way it's, uh, the dimensions uh, are supposed to. Many of you will need a large size cuff, which takes an extra conversation with who's ever selling you the machine. Um, and then sit comfortably, take, uh, uh, have your arm be unclothed, uh, and so on, as we discussed before you take it. Take it before breakfast, before your medications, and take it before dinner. Um, consider ambulatory monitoring for those who are in a toss-up zone. You're just not sure what to do, especially after this talk. Um, and uh, so an ambulatory monitor is an excellent tiebreaker. Uh, it gives you a, another complete, relatively inexpensive, totally safe, in, uh, non-invasive uh, way to collect information. Uh, and look at your cardiovascular risk. So uh, you would be doing this anyway if you're interested in preventing heart disease or stroke with the use of aspirin or statins, because we make those decisions based on your risk. And what this literature now suggests is that we should be using that risk prediction uh, to help decide who should be on blood pressure pills too. And if you're really low risk, uh, then the benefit uh, for you uh, may be a very high number needed to treat. In other words, it may not be worth it to you uh, to take the medications. And again, it, then it depends on side effects and preferences and costs and so on. I think 140 over 90 is a reasonable compromise uh, these days. I think, um, although this new paper, again, uh, questions uh, whether that's maybe too low, but nonetheless, I think most of the literature would suggest that for most people, 140 over 90 is a is a good number at which we begin treatment. Uh, but make sure that is a, taken correctly, because if it's falsely elevated, uh, then uh, um, way too many people will be treated. Uh, 150 over 90 is probably fine for a lot of low risk, older, uh, older, over age 60 uh, people, not so old, uh, but over age 60, um, uh, that to be between 140 and 150 is not the end of things. It's fine, if, especially if you're having side effects. 
don't want to take a third medicine, say, or whatever, uh, that may be fine for a lot of people, especially if your overall risk uh, is low or whatever your personal preferences are, given that gray box diagram that I show that you may not be the one who benefits. And for those who are very high risk, especially those with bad heart disease, uh, treating less than 130 over 80 uh, may make sense. Um, uh, if you're in that situation, you're probably seeing a cardiologist already anyway, and it will be their preference to treat you to 130 over 80, and that's okay, because uh, that's where the evidence is uh, strongest. Um, and again, uh, use shared decision making. Uh, what we mean by this is that try to understand the numbers as well as you can. Um, health literacy is complicated, and this is what we call health numeracy, which is understanding the numbers, which is even more complicated. Uh, but if you're inclined that way and, and have a clinician who's willing to work the numbers or point you to a good website, uh, then it's worth thinking about it. And you, given the number needed to treat and the uncertainty here, I think it's, it would be incorrect for clinicians to be dogmatic. And so I think your preferences about uh, this uh, rule the day. Um, and what we've learned uh, uh, particularly strongly of late is that uh, uh, using team approaches uh, are very effective and some of the big systems like Kaiser Northern California and others have done a ter terrific job controlling blood pressure in their population uh, with some innovative strategies that really rely on uh, non-physicians uh, particularly uh, helping to manage blood pressure but it also includes careful measurements so that people aren't mislabeled. So with that, I'll thank you and stop and uh, leave plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the, the question is, uh, where does stroke and atrial fibrillation come in? Well, the easiest thing to say is that in the causative relationship, high blood pressure is a risk factor for producing both. So uh, we definitely know that people with hypertension and elevated blood pressure are at greater risk for stroke. Uh, and also greater risk for atrial fibrillation. Um, atrial fibrillation, the medicines we use to control atrial fibrillation double, often do double duty as blood pressure pills. So some of the calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, things like that. Uh, and so it's not, in clinical practice, it's usually not that big a conversation because you already need those medicines to control your heart rate. Uh, since that's one of the ways they work. Uh, but for stroke, uh, we, we do recommend uh, tighter control, but 140 is probably fine. You don't have to go to 130, because uh, there is a little bit of risk of being too low uh, for some of these diseases as well. And uh, so 140 is probably the right way to go uh, for both atrial fibrillation and stroke. Uh, and, mo and very importantly, although this is more your doctor, your clinician's uh, uh, issue is when you're in the hospital with a stroke, we let the blood pressure ride very high. And we've learned that treating it too soon can be quite dangerous. So uh, that's a little counterintuitive, but if you wander the halls of the neurointensive care unit here, you'll see people with blood pressures routinely over 180, 190, and so forth. That's just when they're in the hospital during the acute stroke. As they come out over the course of four to six weeks or whatever, then we begin to begin to treat it uh, with a goal of getting less than 140 for sure. If they have concurrent heart disease, then we go to 130. So the question was in the, um, the number needed, the, sh the, the grid with the number needed to treat, uh, the harms were uh, low blood pressure, syncope, uh, blood, blood test abnormalities, and kidney abnormalities. So they were uh, all pre-designed side effects. Um, that were uh, thought serious enough to send uh, the patients to the hospital uh, to be evaluated. But, so they're serious, but they're not like having a heart attack or a stroke or dying. You know, so that's when I say they're serious, but not as serious as the benefits. Yes, there are medicines that can cause high blood pressure. Um, uh, the most important are illegal ones. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Methamphetamine and cocaine are uh, uh, two on the short list. Uh, some of the other derivatives in that category, such as uh, pseudoephedrine that people take sometimes for respiratory uh, congestion, uh, phentermine, which is a weight loss drug that I don't recommend, can raise your blood pressure, and there are a handful of others. 
Well, that depends. So the comment was about prostate medicine. Uh, the most common prostate medicine uh, actually lowers your blood pressure. Uh, it's a med medicines, a class of medicines, in fact, that we used to use to treat low blood, treat high blood pressure. So that would be an unusual circumstance. Uh, but um, yeah, let's see. Is very low blood pressure a risk factor? Yeah, uh, that's controversial. Um, the if you were if if we ha if if you were going to draw the relationship between ill health and blood pressure on a curve, the shape of the curve is a, so ill health would be on the y-axis, your blood pressure is on the x-axis. The shape of the curve in many studies is a J. Uh, that is to say uh, that the lowest blood pressures are associated with poor outcomes. Now that's a little bit confusing because some of the people in those kind of studies are sick. And so if you're frail and at the end of life and your blood pressure is coming down, that may account for some of that J. But the current concern is that it also may increase the risk of heart attacks, that you need a certain, a, a certain blood pressure to fill the, the vessels that supply the heart when the heart is relaxing, so-called diastole. And so uh, there is a concern about that. It's not proven. Uh, the studies have yo-yoed a little bit over the course of uh, the last several decades. But it is a concern um, that over-treatment, or at least in de novo, before, without treatment, uh, people with lower pro uh, blood pressures are, may well be at increased risk. And in the treatment studies, if you treat too low, uh, there may be an increased risk of heart attack in at-risk patients. And so that is one of the concerns. And that's why you saw that people were passing out um, with the aggressive treatment. They weren't having more heart attacks, though, in that, that study. So the literature is mostly reassuring, uh, but there has been a concern circulating in the, in the scientific community that may be too low uh, can increase the risk of heart attacks. But in, in, in many heart conditions, like heart failure, we treat people very low. And that's for a different reason. That's to allow the heart to function, to pump better. Uh, so that's a different conversation. So there are different circumstances where we would strategically aim for low. But for specifically coronary artery disease, there is this, this concern. But again, the SPRINT study was reassuring in that regard. There was no increased risk of heart attack in the low group. In fact, they had less heart attacks. So the current thinking is it's probably OK, then, and especially if it's your second number that's really low. So sometimes, especially as people get older, the blood, the blood vessels get stiff. And so uh, the upper number may be high, and you have systolic high blood pressure, but the lower number is really low, like 60 or 40, or maybe it just keeps, you never goes, you know, you can't record any number. Um, and that's okay. Uh, as far as we think that that's okay, that that's not associated with increased risk. But it has been in the literature as a concern, but the current thinking is it's probably not a problem. So the question is, is there any evidence about which class of drugs is better for any specific patient? And if you go back in the, the, the history of the Joint National Commission recommendations over the years, there, there's been a wide variety, you know, there was a, several iterations where thiazides were best for everyone. So I used to tell the residents, everyone should be started on a thiazide. And then the literature changed a little bit and it became thiazides or beta blockers. So then I would say to the residents, well, thiazides should be for first or second. You know, you could start with beta blocker, you could start with thiazide. Now, we have three other drugs, so now we say thiazides need to be in the top three. Uh, so the recommendations have changed. Um, as you'll notice, beta blockers are off the list because we think they don't work as well to prevent stroke. The prostate medicines are off the list because they're inferior to other classes of blood pressure pills. Um, and uh, in African Americans, as monotherapy, uh, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs don't work as well. But the other studies, there, there is a literature out there of monotherapy, you know, which drug is better to start, but it, that's, that's sort of a silly question because most people end up, as they age anyway, and needing more than one drug. Uh, 
Uh, and so it doesn't really matter what you start with because everything works. Um, and it's really more about side effect profile, cost, formulary, preferences, and so on. So if thiazide makes you urinate, uh, and that's a problem for you, then that's not a good drug for you. And it doesn't matter whether it's two millimeters better than the other one or not. Uh, or if ACE inhibitors cause your potassium to go too high, uh, then that becomes a more dominant question than whether it's two millimeters better or for worse. But in general, the main thinking is that in African Americans, there is a class preference based on uh, race. But if for everyone else, it's thought to be neutral. And that's why you get the smorgasbord of four classes. So there, are, there is a literature on that, but it's probably not worth concerning about it, and the guidelines have ignored that literature, basically discounted it. So the question is, uh, if, home, if home measurement is, um, is low then, um, and your office measurement is high, is it uh, a measurement error uh, or is it white coat hypertension? The answer is we don't know. Uh, and so what you want to do is either thoughtfully look at the cuff you purchased or what I would recommend to a patient is to bring the cuff in uh, and we'll do it together uh, and see what the story is. But sometimes the cuffs are just too small. Um, the sphingomanometers in the office are maintained carefully. The digital uh, measurements that many of the, uh, the offices use are as good as the mercury sphingomanometer if they're maintained correctly. Uh, and the home measurement tools can be as well, especially if it's a standard sphingomanometer. Uh, but, you know, things need to be maintained. So a cuff that ages uh, may lose its accuracy. And Consumer Reports does review uh, these, and uh, I won't favor any one machine over another, but they do. Um, and, um, and so they're a good organization. I'd follow their recommendations. But I think the most valuable thing is to bring the cuff into the physician's office and just compare. And that way you'll get a chance to see how you're doing, you know, if your measurement technique is good and if the equipment is good. And on that note, I'll stop. I'll stay and take some additional questions up front. Good evening, everyone. Thank you.